All right, let me just pray again. Father in heaven, Lord, as I begin my lecture, I just pray that you would, uh, would bless. Please help the technology to work right. And uh, we just pray that you would be with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to talk about digestion tonight. Does anybody in here ever experience any problems with your digestive system? Oh, okay, I see some nods, no hands. Okay. All right, well, we're just going to talk about a few things that could help your digestive system work better. And um, I'm going to start by saying that a lot of people, for digestion, it means indigestion. And if you go to the store, you'll see rows and rows and rows of medications for all kinds of digestive system problems, right? And sometimes I watch people when they go through the grocery line uh, in front of me. You know, I, I like to look at people's carts, not to... Uh, you know, not Adventist cards, I don't look at those, but just to see what people are eating and what they have. And a lot of times I'll see food in there that I know is going to give them indigestion, and then I see the medication right behind the food on the, on the, the roller thing. It's very interesting. But uh, there are some simple things you can do that you can avoid having to take all of these things. Uh, one of the problems that people have is heartburn, right? Uh, gastric reflux, you may feel pain or burning sensation, that's very common. Uh, also bloating, gas, people uh, have those gassy moments. And, uh, and then you can get into more serious problems also like ulcers, uh, and which could be, you know, they can be cleared up or they can be quite serious and get very bad. And then weight gain is also associated with wrong eating habits. And how about insomnia? Anybody ever have insomnia? Sometimes if you do, that can be from having food in your stomach when you go to bed or, or, or what you've eaten. You may not even realize it, but you wake up and your, you know, your eyes are just won't go back to sleep. They won't close. And so I think maybe uh, for different reasons, but food can be a problem. Uh, mental dullness. Uh, sometimes people wake up and they feel... Even if they've slept eight hours, they may feel tired. Maybe the bags under their eyes are bigger than usual. Uh, you know, and they, they, their brain may be a little bit fuzzy. Have you ever had that feeling? And sometimes people don't sleep, but even if you do sleep, you may have uh, not feel up to par when you wake up. And how about irritability? And uh, that can also, you may not realize why you're, you're feeling irritable, but that can go along with digestive system problems too, as well as lack of sleep. And then there are chronic diseases that occur, diseases of the pancreas, of the gallbladder, of the, the liver, all sorts of uh, digestive, uh, part of the uh, regular digestive tract as well as accessory organs can become diseased from wrong eating habits. But Proverbs 26.2 tells us, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, if you have a problem, there's a reason for it. There's a cause. And so what you want to do is track down the cause of that problem. So we're going to look at a few causes tonight. Uh, we'll start by saying that there are 9,000 taste buds on the human tongue. And that tells me that God intended for us to enjoy our food, right? Unfortunately, those taste buds can become perverted. And we can enjoy things that are not the best for us. But that's where digestion begins. It's in the mouth. And we have both mechanical digestion. And what would be mechanical digestion in the mouth? Chewing, your teeth are grinding uh, that food down to pulverize it so that you can um, digest it better when you get to the chemical digestion. The breaking those food particles apart allows enzymes and other uh, digestive juices to come in and be able to reach those food particles better to break it down because what you're wanting to do is get it down small enough that the chemicals can actually release those nutrients so that you can absorb them. And in the mouth, the food goes in. And as I said, we use our teeth and we chew that food. Now, most people don't chew well enough. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Because you really have to grind that food up. And from there, it goes on down into the stomach. In the stomach, 
we get both chemical and mechanical digestion. No, your stomach doesn't have teeth, but it churns. It has three layers of muscles going in different directions, and it continuously churns that food to mix it. And then the digestive juices come in and uh, work on that food. Now, if you didn't chew your food well, you're not going to have as good of digestion in the stomach for more than one reason, not just breaking the food particles down, but in the mouth, you get some amylase that comes in, and that starts carbohydrate digestion. And so if you don't chew your food well and mix it with that saliva, then you don't get that carbohydrate digestion started. And you also get a little lipase, which starts fat digestion. As it goes down into the stomach, those enzymes go with it and continue digesting there in the stomach. And then uh, acids come in, things that start protein digestion. And so then you have uh, more protein digestion as these enzymes are digested themselves. Protein digestion will be the bulk of what happens there. And then as it gets to a certain pH, a certain temperature, a certain consistency, it will go on down into the small intestine. And in the small intestine, uh, you get more, um, you get lots of more enzymes, digestive juices that come in. They come in from the pancreas. You get bile from the gallbladder uh, made in the liver comes in. And the, it continues this chemical digestion in the small intestine. And then you get absorption. Now, the small intestine is really designed for good absorption. Uh, these are layers of folds inside the small intestine. And out on these folds, this really increases surface area. And then out on these folds come these little projections called villi. And this is a, a, a real picture of villi here, greatly enlarged. And this gives tremendous surface area for all of these nutrients to be absorbed. And then on this villi, you will have this little tiny border called a brush border with microvilli, and that increases your surface area even more. So all these nutrients that are being released are absorbed into the bloodstream or into the lymphatic system, uh, and which dumps into the bloodstream later. So you're absorbing all of these nutrients that you take in. And what's left over goes on down into the colon. And this is where a lot of people get problems. Uh, we talked about fiber already this week and how important that is to make your colon work right and to keep your stool uh, working uh, the proper consistency. Okay, now uh, that's a little overview, a quick overview of the digestive system. And what we want to look at now, how can we make that system work better? So I'm going to give you seven simple steps. This is not everything, but it's a good portion of the picture. And if you can do these seven things, then it's going to help you have better digestion. The first one is regular meal times. You know, we live in a society today that we're kind of like cows and goats, right? We graze a little bit here and a little bit there uh, whenever we want to. And that was the way I grew up. If you were hungry, you ate. And as I was a younger child, we started out with more regular meal times, but that sort of disintegrated as... Uh, life went on and we watched more television and we got busier, then, um, then we uh, started not having these regular meal times so much. One person would eat now, another person later, and so forth. But regular meal times helps your system work better. And uh, you know we are creatures of habit and your digestive system likes to have habit also. So that your digestive juices are made, they're ready, you're really hungry, at the right time if you have regular meal times. And the second thing that goes along with that that I've already mentioned is no grazing or no snacking. And a lot of times, we know, when we talk about diet, then people say, well, what's good for snacks? And I say, nothing is good for snacks. <laughs> we don't need to be snacking. And uh, so that's very important. And I just want to read. Um, this quote to you, I have more quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy tonight than I do studies, but I think it says it uh, all in these quotes. The first one is from Councils on Diet and Foods, page 179, 
After the regular meal is eaten, the stomach should be allowed to rest for five hours. Not a particle of food should be introduced into the stomach till the next meal. And so some people say, but that doesn't include fruit, does it? <laughs> but that's a particle of food, isn't it? A piece of fruit? Yes, it does interfere. And from Child Guidance 389, the stomach must have careful attention. It must not be kept in continual operation. You know, that's how we wear digestive organs out. We need uh, rest for them, just like you need rest at night. Your digestive organs need some rest. And so if you're continually working them, then they start to get problems. They need a little, little break. And if you haven't read the book, Councils on Diet and Foods, by the way, it is a wonderful book. The first part of it connects the spiritual condition with the, the diet and the physical. And it's a very important book for us in these, in these last days. Okay, and then I also want to prevent, uh, present a study that was done, I believe this was at Loma Linda. Uh, they gave these subjects in this study a large breakfast. Cereal, fruit, toast, and an egg. Okay, and then they looked at how full their stomach was. It was, we'll consider it full. Now, the glasses of water in this picture represent the stomach. The full glass is the full stomach on the left. And then four hours later, after this breakfast, uh, they found that their stomachs were empty. So it took about four hours to clear out their stomachs from this breakfast that they ate. And then several days later, they repeated this study, and they gave them the same breakfast, cereal, fruit, toast, and an egg. How long? Uh, they waited about two hours, and they gave them a snack this time. Now, that wasn't in the first study, but two hours later in this, they gave them a snack, either a peanut butter sandwich or a piece of pumpkin pie with a glass of milk. Do you think, how long do you think it took breakfast to get out of their stomach when they added this little snack in? Okay, six hours. Do you think all of breakfast would have been out by six hours? Or do you think all the food would have been out by six hours? Okay, what, what they found was, people have varying guesses on this, but what they found was that six to even nine hours later, part of breakfast was still in, some, in the stomach. So for some of these people, part of breakfast was still in the stomach nine hours later. Now, we're not talking about the snack. We're talking about breakfast still being in there, okay? So what, what happens is when you throw new food in with food that's already partially digested, it kind of confuses everything. You've got things that are in a different state of being broken down, and so it can't... It, remember, the stomach is churning, so it churns all of this together, and it can't release that breakfast, which is mixed in with this new food that's not digested. So it does it a little bit at a time, but it really interferes with that digestion when you do that. Now, they took one person in this same study, and they gave them the same breakfast, cereal, fruit, toast, and an egg. But they made a little change. Here they gave them a little bit of chocolate candy twice in the morning and twice in the afternoon. And it was about like two Hershey's Kisses would be. It was a small amount of candy. What do you think? Do you think that was enough to interfere with breakfast? Or maybe it didn't have any effect because it was so small? How long do you think it took for breakfast to get out of the stomach with this little addition? Okay, it, it actually, they found that 13 hours later, more than half of breakfast was still in the stomach. More than half, just from those little bits of candy that they had. So remember the quote, it said, not a particle of food should be introduced into the stomach. Now the third principle is breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and supper like a pauper. That means that you don't have enough money to buy any food for supper, okay? And so we want to get up, and this is kind of the opposite of what a lot of people do. Many people will eat the big meal at night, and that's, that's the way I grew up. We had, a, we had a hearty breakfast when I grew up because my mother wanted me, us to, to, uh, uh, me not to be sickly. And unfortunately, she made me a very fat child with that concept. She uh, 
we, we ate a lot of, of meat and eggs. And so my breakfast as a child was like two eggs sunny side up, you know, and some bacon or sausage and a lard biscuit and maybe some grits with red eye gravy, which is grease and coffee mixed together. Um, you know, <laughs> she wanted me to have a healthy breakfast, right? I never saw fruit except at Christmas time or, you know, um, maybe an apple pie during the year. But she tried. She didn't, she didn't know. But we, we want a hearty breakfast of healthy food, right? And, uh, and then a good, good lunch. And then, but when you're getting ready to go to bed, you're not going to be burning that food. And so you want a very small food, a small amount of food at night, or none at all. And I found that most people do better if they just, um, you know, don't even eat at night. I, I've finally gotten on to two meals a day, but, you know, we eat hearty breakfast and lunch, and I don't even get hungry at night now, and I sleep so much better. You want an empty stomach before you go to bed, and if it's not empty, it interferes with your sleep. And so your stomach is trying to digest your food, your brain is trying to go through its processing that it goes through when you're asleep, and these processes interfere with each other and neither works very well. And so sometimes you, you may wake up and not know why you can't go back to sleep, or you're, you may wake up and your stomach hurts, or it may not, not necessarily uh, hurting, sometimes it will. But it's just not the best. You want your stomach. So if you do eat at night, it should be something easily digested. Uh, fruit is a good one. And then I'll just read this quote to go along with us. At breakfast time, the stomach is in a better condition to take care of more food than at the second or third meal of the day. The habit of eating a sparing breakfast and a large dinner is wrong. Make your breakfast correspond more nearly to the heartiest meal of the day. And then we've uh, already mentioned the teeth. We need to chew our food well. You know, we live in a hurry today. Everybody's in a hurry. And we, we talk fast, we work fast, and we come in at mealtime, and we don't have much time, and we eat fast. And we sort of swallow our food whole sometimes instead of chewing it like we should. And so we really need to take time to chew our food. Uh, there have been studies shown, uh, done that show that when you don't chew your food, a lot of that just passes on through, so you're not going to get the nutrients from that food that you need. And another quote from Councils on Diet and Foods, in order to secure healthy digestion, food should be eaten slowly. The benefit derived from food does not depend so much on the quantity eaten as on its thorough digestion. And then the fifth principle, drink water between meals, not with your meals. And if you drink with your meals, it dilutes your digestive juices. The water has to be absorbed before you can actually digest your food. And it just slows that process down. It bogs the stomach down. So it's better to drink lots of water between meals, a little ways away from your meal time and let, give that time to be absorbed. After a meal, you want to give your digestion time to take place uh, to get a lot of that done before you throw that water in. And it's better not to drink anything between meals but water. Okay, and then eat just enough, not too much. You know, that's one of the hardest ones because we have to eat. And so the tendency is to overeat. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a family we ate to capacity and it's hard to break that habit of being temperate and to, to be temperate, I mean. And so this is something we need to, uh, need to work on, that we don't overeat. They've actually shown in studies now that when people eat to about 72% uh, percent of capacity, they live longer. It actually extends your life uh, more than if we eat all the way full all the time. Another quote, what influence does overeating have upon the stomach? it becomes debilitated. The digestive organs are weakened and disease with all its train of evils is brought on as the result. And so uh, we need to look at each of these habits and then avoid foods that hinder the digestive system. And I think you know what I'm going to say here. <laughs> these are the things we've been talking. We, you know, a good whole food plant-based diet works, uh, makes your digestive system work better. But high fat meals uh, are very difficult to digest and so uh, they don't work so well. You want to go uh, 
low on the meat, the animal products, those are more difficult to digest. Cheese is almost indigestible. It's about 70% fat. More, more than half of that can be saturated fat. I used to be a cheeseaholic, but it really, uh, I had an experience after I quit eating cheese about two years later. We were at a friend's house. They served a cheese pizza. So I said, okay, we'll have, because uh, I didn't want to hurt their feelings. That's what they served us. So we ate cheese pizza. And I, you know, I, like I said, I ate a lot of cheese uh, two years before. We were eating lots and lots of cheese when we quit. And that night, I could not sleep. It was like there was a ball of lead in my stomach. I could not digest it. And that was the last time I ate cheese. It really was painful, a painful experience. Caffeine also uh, interferes with the digestive system. It does promote gastroesophageal esophageal reflux. And so if you have a problem with gastric reflux, you might consider cutting out the caffeine. But there's many other reasons you shouldn't be using caffeine either. But that would, is one that also affects the colon. It can cause you to flip-flop back and forth between diarrhea and constipation. Spicy foods are not good for the stomach. And although you will see some studies that show benefits, there are many studies that show it's harmful. I saw a meta-analysis of studies from around the world, and it showed that countries where they eat the most hot peppers have the most stomach cancer, and the people in those countries that eat the most hot peppers have the most stomach cancer. And it's in a dose-related fashion. The more hot peppers they ate, the uh, greater the risk of stomach cancer. And I also had my experience when I was in Jamaica in 2010. The food is very spicy there. It tasted very good to me. But I started getting stomach pain uh, after I ate it. And so I had to, to not eat some of the foods because I was not used to those anymore, even though at one time I'd eaten a lot of spicy foods. My stomach was, was sensitive, and uh, I got a lot of, lot of pain from that. Too much salt is also harmful for many reasons. It affects uh, almost every system in the body. But it does uh, increase your risk of stomach cancer and uh, risk of Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacteria that causes stomach ulcers and even uh, stomach cancer. And then the fiberless foods, we've already talked about that, how they wreak havoc in the digestive system if we don't have that fiber that we need and affect the body in many other ways. Uh, too many varieties of food will fall in here too. Uh, sometimes when we go to, let's say you go out to eat and there's a buffet, or sometimes at different church potlucks, there'll be lots of different foods, and we tend to do too many combinations. We had a young man at our health center years ago, and he was very sick on Sunday. He said his stomach was hurting, he didn't feel well. And so I thought, well, maybe he had food poisoning. And so we were trying to discover why, and I said, well, what did you eat yesterday at church potluck? He said, oh, it was so good. I tried everything twice. So I said, well, you know, there's your problem. <laughs> okay. So we're just going to go through this again. One, regular meal times. Two, no snacking. Three, breakfast like a king. Four, chew well. Five, no drinking with your meals. Drink between meals, but not, be, not uh, between, but not with. Don't overeat and avoid those foods that are really bog your digestive system down. And I think you will see just some amazing wonders uh, regarding problems that you might have. And 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether you, uh, therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So we want to glorify God and not only what we eat, but how we eat it. Amen?